Dear friends, let's now move on to the poem Be Drunk by the French poet Charla Boudilaire. Boudilaire published his first collection of poems called Flowers of Evil in 1857. This collection was rejected on the grounds of taboo issues such as sex and lesbianism. Thirteen of the poems were found to be religiously intolerable and immoral. In the year 1869, he published his next collection of short story poems called Paris Spleen. However, he became famous with his translations of the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Let's move on to the poem Be Drunk. Be Drunk you have to be always drunk, that's all there is to it. It's the only way, so as not to feel the horrible burden of time that breaks your back and bends you to the earth. You have to be continually drunk. But on what? Wine, poetry or virtue as you wish, but be drunk. And sometimes on the steps of a palace or the green grass of a ditch, in the mournful solitude of your room, you wake again. Drunkenness, already diminishing or gone. Ask the wind, the wave, the star, the bird, the clock. Everything that is flying, everything that is groaning, everything that is rolling, everything that is singing, everything that is speaking. Ask what time it is. And wave, wind, star, Bird, clock will answer you. It is time to be drunk. So as not to be the martyr slaves of time, be drunk. Be continually drunk on wine, on poetry or on virtue as you wish. The poet says that it's good to be drunk always. Because that's the only way that time can be evaded. The tiresome feeling can be evaded. The burden of time cannot be felt. Because time breaks your back and bends you to earth. Time reminds us of all the hopes that have been lost. Time reminds us of promises not made or kept. Ambitions not realized. Aims not achieved. And if one has to spend time on earth fruitfully, then one must drink. Drink what? Wine, poetry or virtue, says the poet. Wine doesn't literally mean wine, but it means anything that is so intoxicating that it would make you forget time, the tyranny of time. Poetry. Poetry could be any talent that you have nurtured, any talent that has not been realized, or virtue. Virtue does not mean just being virtuous, but being loving, being able to love neighbors, being humane, but be drunk. Engage yourself in any activity that will give you happiness. And if sometimes on the steps of a palace or the green grass of a ditch, in the mournful solitude of your room, you wake again. Probably loneliness or solitude is one thing that we can never escape. And if you feel yourself lonely or in solitude, you wake up. You feel that drunkenness has already diminished or gone. You no more feel that you're happy about the life that you live with. Ask the wind. The wave, the star, the bird, the clock. The poet asks us to go to nature. Ask the wave, the star, the bird, the clock. Everything that is flying, that is groaning, rolling, singing and speaking. And what time it is. And wind, wave, star, bird, clock will answer, it is time to be drunk. In the sense, it is time to start Fulfilling whatever you have not achieved. It's time to live life to the best possible extent. 
It's time to gratify oneself. It's time to engage in activities that would make us realize our potential so as not to be martyred slaves of time. Time is not a slave. Time is a cruel master. In order not to allow time to be our master, but time should be made our friend, one must be continually drunk, either on wine, poetry or virtue. The poet emphasizes the importance of living life doing things that give us that gives us happiness doing anything that would give us happiness it's not only material pleasures that are important but being genuine being involved in whatever one does is very important it's not only materialistic pleasures name fame that would make one happy but living life Enjoying whatever we are doing, that gives true happiness. The poem is highly optimistic because it tells us that time cannot be seen only as a destroyer. Because time is fleeting. Time always moves. It's man who has to learn how to spend time. Man has to involve in activities that not only involve satisfaction but also that gives realization of ambitions and hopes in the sick hurry of divided aims in the sick hurry of fulfilling or realizing whatever we have to do we forget to live it is good to realize one's ambition it's good to live life in full fulfilling whatever one can do but one must not forget to get happiness from what one does. Very often we are caught up with our ambitions and in the run or in the race of life, we often forget to live. That is very, very important. Nature fulfills everything it has to do. Nature does everything genuinely. Nature does not expect anything in return. What about man? He lives life in a routine manner. The boredom of existence takes over him and that's when time becomes tyrannous. The poem does not advocate escape from time, but use time to realize whatever one feels one can be done. Use time fruitfully to realize ambitions and reach goals in life. And in this journey, do not make time your master. Don't be a slave of time. But learn how to use time fruitfully. This is the theme of the poem. With this, we move on to the next poem, Landscape of the Capaberry River by João Cabral Jumelu Neto, the Brazilian poet. Landscape of the Capaberry River The city is crossed by the river as a street is crossed by a dog, a piece of fruit by a sword. The river called to mind a dog's docile tongue or a dog's sad belly or that other river which is a dirty wet cloth of a dog's two ears. The river was like a dog without feathers. It knew rose nothing of the blue rain or the rose-colored fountain of the water in a water glass of the water in pictures of the fish in the water of the breeze on the water it knew the crabs of mud and rust it knew silt like a mucous membrane it must have known the octopus and surely knew the feverish women living in oysters the river never opens up to fish to the shimmer to the knifely unrest existing in fish it never opens up in fish. It opens up in flowers, poor and black. Like black men and women, it opens up to a flora as squalid and beggarly. 
as a blacks who must beg it opens up in hard leaved mangroves kimki as a black man's hair smooth like the belly of a pregnant dog the river swells without ever bursting the river's childbirth is like a dog's fluid and invertebrate and i never saw it seed as bread when rising seeds in silence the river bears its bloating poverty pregnant with black earth it yields in silence in black earthen capes in black earthen boots or gloves of the foot or hand that plunges in as sometimes happens with dogs the river seemed to stagnate ice waters would turn thicker and warmer flowing with the thick warm waves of a snake it had something of a crazy man's stagnation something of the stagnation of hospitals prisons asylums of the dirty and smothered life dirty smothering laundry it trudged through something of the stagnation of decayed palaces eaten by mold and mistletoe something of the stagnation of obese trees dripping a thousand sugars from the panambuco dining rooms it trudged through it is there with their backs to the river that the city's cultured families brood over the fast eggs of their prose in the complete peace of their kitchens they viciously stir their pots of sticky indolence could the river's water be the fruit of some trees why did it seem like ripened water why the flies always above all as if about to land did any part of the river ever cascade in joy was it ever anywhere a song or fountain why then were its eyes painted blue on maps this poem talks about issues related to pollution the landscape of the capybara river the capybara river ran through brazil through panambuco but what happens to the river or why is the river not as pleasant as it should have been the river is a part of nature but the poet says the city is crossed by the river as a street is crossed by a dog a very casual tone that's employed and a very unusual comparison or the analogy is quite nauseating in the sense how could one compare a river to a dog a piece of fruit by a sword just as a piece of fruit is cut by a sword again instead of knife the poet has used sword the river called to mind a dog's docile tongue the poet has used the image of the dog its docile tongue hung out ever flowing or a dog's sad belly or that other river which is the dirty wet cloth of a dog's two eyes probably water that's just coming out water that flows could be compared to water that comes out from the dog's two eyes the river was like a dog without feathers it knew rose nothing of the blue rain or the rose colored fountain the river does not know anything about the blue rain the rose colored fountain the water in the water glass or water in pictures the fish or the breeze on water it did know about it once but now it doesn't know about it now all these symbolize all these denote water that's clean but now it knows the crabs of mud and rust it knows the silt dirt covered water like a mucous membrane it must have known the octopus and surely knew the feverish women living in oysters once it knew about these animals but now it doesn't know for the river never opens up to fish to the shimmer to the nightly unrest existing in fish it never opens up in fish you don't even find fish these days but it opens up in flowers poor and black you find flowers dead decayed matter like black men and women it opens up into flora as squalid and beggarly the water is dirty as a black who must beg it opens up in hard leaved mangroves kinky as a black man's hair and all the dirt that gathers up in water you find them be- beside the mangroves 
just like a black man's hair all knotted up. Smooth like the belly of a pregnant dog. The water is like the belly of a pregnant dog and the river swells without ever bursting. The river's childbirth is like a dog's fluid and invertebrate. All the dust that has gathered, all the dirt that has gathered, the squalor, the water is black in color because of silt, the effluence from the factories and all sorts of things that are being dumped in rivers. And I never saw it seed as bread when rising seeds. In silence, the river hears its bloating poverty, pregnant with black earth. The water that was once rich, the water that had or that supported life, now no longer supports life as it should have done. And so it bloats in poverty. It's like a pregnant dog. Its belly is like that of a pregnant dog. Pregnant in the sense, pregnant with dirt, mud and all sorts of filth. With black earth. Black earth denotes dirt. It yields in silence in black earthen capes, in black earthen boots or gloves. Everything is black, which means it does not denote freshness. It does not denote cool waters. It does not denote water that's good enough for consumption. For the foot or hand that plunges in. Man deposits waste. He decays the landscape. It's not only the landscape but the waterscape too. As sometimes happens with dogs, the rivers seem to stagnate. Water gets stagnated. There is no free flow of water because of the accumulation of waste seem to stagnate. Its waters would turn thicker and warmer. Naturally, with waste being dumped into water, it would turn thicker and warmer, flowing with the thick warm waves of a snake. Just as a snake would slither, the water slithers through. There is no easy flow of water. It had something of a crazy man's stagnation, something of the stagnation of hospitals, prisons, asylums. So waste, it runs through all these places. Where you have hospitals, you have prisons, asylums, the dirty and smothered life, dirty smothering laundry, it trudged through. It went through all these places of human habitation. Something of the stagnation of decayed palaces, eaten by mold and mistlet too. Something that was covered by mold. Something of the stagnation of obese trees, dripping a thousand sugars, from the Panambuco dining rooms, it trudged through. The people, the city, people who live in cities, they throw waste into water and the water trudged through all those places. It is there, with their backs to the river, that the city's cultured families, cultured families in Dublin, but commas, we call ourselves civilized. But how civilized is man? Questions the poet. Brood over the fast eggs of their prose. In the complete peace of their kitchens, they viciously stir their pots of sticky indolence. They use the water from the river to cook food. But do they ever realize how they have been poisoning the river? They are happy with whatever they have, but they seem to be destroying nature. The last two paragraphs stands us, in fact, are questions. Could the river's water be the fruit of some trees? Why did it seem like ripened water? Why the flies always above it, as if about to land? Do you think the dirt that you see floating above water is from some tree? Why did it seem like ripened water? Ripened in the sense it's got a yellow tinge. The yellow is nothing but the effluence from factories, not only factories, but also waste, human waste, waste from houses, waste from the kitchen, waste due to washing clothes there. Why are the flies always above it as if about to land? And you always, you always have flies there, which means the water is not good enough. The water is not clean. Did any part of the river ever cascade in joy? Is the river happy? that it's flowing smoothly? Was it ever anyway a song or fountain? 
Once it could have been a part of a song. It could have been a fountain. Why then were its eyes painted blue on maps? The color of water is blue in maps. But is that the actual color that you find now? Now the water has several colors. It is brown sometimes. It's yellow at times. But most times it's black. Which shows the intensity of pollution of rivers. This poem is filled with images. The first is the image of the dog. The protruded belly of the dog, the pregnant dog. The river flows through the city as a dog would cross the city. The river is not happy. The river is not reminded of its pristine quality anymore. It only knows how dirty it is. It does not open up to fish, octopus, the other sea creatures, but it opens only to the waste that has been dumped. It does not know anything about the fountain. It does not know anything about freshness. It's stale. It's black. It assumes different colors as it flows through the different landscapes. The poem talks about the degradation of nature, especially water pollution. It also talks about man's unconcern about the destruction of such landscapes. Man has been using water, but he doesn't know how he has to protect nature. Man is selfish. The image of the dog, the image of the image of color that the poet has used brings about serious issues or it raises environmental concerns. The striking imagery that the poet has used reminds us of how it is important to not only use nature, but also preserve nature. Man has been continuously using nature to satisfy his needs, but he has never thought about protecting nature, especially the water bodies. Water is one of those essential elements of nature, and it's important to preserve water. We move on to the last poem of the section, Homeward by Basi Ikpi, who is a Nigerian-American poet. She was born in Icom Cross River State, Nigeria, and moved to the United States on her fourth birthday. She comes from a village called Ugep at Kalabar. She gives importance not only to her home, her ancestral home, the home where she was born, but also the country that nurtured her or brought her up, the United States. Let's see what the poet has to say about regarding her home. Let's read the poem first. Homeward. Today I remember my grandmother as she attempts to connect with her second children. She finds the only English words she knows from somewhere hidden in the belly of her four foot nine inch body and instead of a wonky she greets us with bye bye beckoning us into her thin clay colored arms she has my mother's face etched with time peers at me from eyes wide and dark like mine i walk into these arms the ones that mothered my mother taught her how to mother me inhaled history from her skin she reminds me of the little girl bow-legged and round-faced, holding roasted corn in one hand and a fistful of chin, chin in the other, still begging for orange Fanta to wash it all down. I remember her voice, firm yet loving, uh, uh, mma, basi, agi, awai, you must eat, then drink, sometimes. I forget, but she remembers the small, scared girl carried away on an iron bird to America. Seems like that same bird had returned only to replace her. That perfect girl with me. This strange, tongue-tied woman. The one that can barely say hello. 
with the clicks and moans, the dips and tones of the white man's language. She listens as, now I struggle with Atum Adem. It breaks my heart to realize that I can only love her clearly in English. But tears do not replace the words, love will not make it easier, make it less heavy. Desire will help me remember what the words taste like flowing, like the cross river from my tongue. But this is not my mother tongue. But this is not my only tongue, insolent and heavy with the awkward movements of amber waves. Coast, east or west, this is not my village. And my heart still longs for my grandmother's voice, steady and strong, crossing rivers and oceans, rounding buildings of mud, touch roof of steel and glass, concrete and confusion. Still, I am that it will not find me here, in this land, miles from the one that welcomed me into this world. Lifetimes before I existed in this cosmopolitan space. Ebon yon in Benyam. Ebon yon in Benyam. What will I teach my children? What will I teach them of where I've been? The earth that shaped me, the hands that held me, the land that made me, what will they call home? And will they hear it if and when it calls them? My heart still holds the salt and clay of you gap. The strength of our women isn't lost in me. But sometimes I forget and find it difficult to walk in bare feet. Afraid to remember what history feels like dust covered and peeking from brown toes. Oklahoma, D.C. Brooklyn will not help me remember Icom, Ugep, Calabar. They will also not let me forget fingers sticky with fufu swallowed whole or tongues stinging numb from plantain fried in palm oil. But I have lost the grit and the grain of my grandmother's gari. I can't Taste past the nostalgic lump in my throat. Can't stomach the reality of my divided culture. African, American, I am everything. And I am nothing. Nigeria quietly begs me to remember, while America slowly urges me to forget. But it's for my past. It's for my future. It is for my children. And it is for you, grandmother, that I must always, always remember. This poem by Ipki is, belongs to the genre of poem called spoken word poetry. Now it's called spoken word poetry because it's narrated in such a way that it talks about the feelings that she had had as she remembers her Nigerian past. The histrionic skills that are involved in this poem the dynamism involved in this poem, the passion with which the poem is narrated, adds to the beauty of this poem. She talks about her grandmother. She says she remembers her grandmother who attempts to connect with her second children, probably her grandchildren. She doesn't know any word in English. All she knows is Nigerian. And see, she greets them with bye-bye instead of saying, come on. She beckons them, takes them in her arms and she looks exactly like the poet's mother. She looks into her grandchildren's eyes. The poet gladly walks into her grandmother's open arms. And she also remembers how she used to eat her favorite food items, the corn, She remembers the love that her grandmother had for her. She used to always pester her to eat, drink. And though the poet has almost forgotten the scared girl as she was carried away on an iron bird to America. The iron bird refers to the aeroplane which the grandmother doesn't know. She understands that the strange tongue-tied woman the one who can hardly say hello, the clicks and moans, the dips and tones of the white man's language because she knows only the language that she speaks. She listens as the poet tries to communicate with her grandma. It breaks my heart to realize that I can only give 
love her clearly in English. She has forgotten the Nigerian language, the tr the, her, her, the language of her community. Now she can talk only in English. And her grandma struggles to understand what she actually wants to say. Though she feels sad, tears would not replace the words. Love would make it easier, but she feels heavy. But she's not able to communicate whatever she wants to to her grandma. And then she understands that her village, that it's in her grandmother's voice that her love remains. The grandmother's voice crosses rivers and oceans, rounding buildings of mud, thatched roof of steel and glass, concrete and confusion. She's torn or divided between two worlds. One, the life in Nigeria and the other in the United States. But she says, that even though she lives in the cosmopolitan space, it's her life in Nigeria, the times in Nigeria, that she would never forget. No, no, nin ben yami. No, no, nin ben yami. What will I teach my children? Again, the language. Which language should she use to teach her children? Is it the foreign language, the white man's language, or her mother tongue? What will I tell them where I've been, the earth that shaped me, the hands that held me, the land that made me, what will they call home? Again, which world or which place should be called her home? Is it the United States or Nigeria, where she was born? Because it was she was born in Nigeria and it was only after she turned four that she had emigrated to the United States. While Nigeria is a birthplace, the United States is a place that had nurtured her. She is not able to compromise. And what will they hear if it... And when it calls them, my heart still holds a salt and clear few gap. The place that she was born. The strength of a woman isn't lost in me. And sometimes I forget and find it difficult to walk in bare feet. Afraid. Oh, remember what history feels like dust covered and peeking from brown toes. It looks as if her past has been crushed by the present. She thinks of Oklahoma, Washington DC, Brooklyn will not help me remember. So if the longer she stays in America, she wouldn't be reminded of ICOM, that is the Cross River State, you get the village where she was born, and Calabar, the city. She would not forget the sticky fingers with which you know, she used to have fufu, uh, the plantain fry, gari, these are food items. The chun chun that she talks about. I can't taste past this nostalgic lump in my throat. There's a lump in her throat because I can't taste past this nostalgic lump in my throat. Nostalgic lump refers to the food items that she's been having. The food items that she used to have as a child. Can't stomach the reality of this, my divided culture. She cannot accept it. She's finding it very difficult to compromise. She's finding it very difficult to get accultured with one at the same time leaving the other. African American, I'm everything, I'm nothing. At the same time, she's both American and African. Simultaneously, she neither belongs to America nor Nigeria. Nigeria quietly begs me to remember. However, Nigeria asks her to remember, while America urges her to forget her native culture. But it's for my past, it's for my future, and it is for my children. And it is for you, Grandma, that I must always, always remember. So here is a poem that talks about how important it is to preserve culture. There are several peculiarities that the grandmother represents. However, the divideness between these two cultures is important. On the one hand, you have the country, United States, that has nurtured her. On the other hand, there is this village, Ugep in Nigeria, that is mother. This cultural divide, this complex emotional feelings are effectively brought out through this spoken word poetry. It is difficult when you grow between uh, two cultures. You wouldn't know which to sacrifice and which to take in. At the same time, the, your mother tongue cannot be forgotten. This poem makes a natural connection between two worlds. It says one cannot be remembered 
sacrificing the other. Both are important. Which is to be chosen? That's for the poet to decide. And the poet says that she must always remember Nigeria, even though it is the United States that has brought her up, nurtured her abilities. It is Nigeria that has given birth to her. And it is this culture that she must not forget, even though the United States beckons her to forget her native culture. Through a series of memories of her childhood days, through everything that expresses nostalgia, the poet has been able to bring out her anxiety, her anguish, the cultural divide that she experiences. Being brought up in Nigeria and being cultured in America. Staying in Nigeria for some time, growing up to be a young woman in the United States. While Nigeria is a place of childhood, place where she was born. The U.S. is a place that made her strong, independent, nurtured her abilities and brought her up. Yet, she finds it very difficult to stick on to one culture. This cultural divide is experienced by most people who have migrated from one country to the other. What is to be forgotten, which culture is to be adopted, is left to the person alone. Thank you. This series of poems has brought out several issues experienced by poets from several parts of the world. From personal issues, to nostalgia, to longings, to desires, to environmental issues. This collection has offered a look into all those concerns, all those pressing issues that man has been going through. This is not the problem of one person alone, but an entire community. In our next session, we will be dealing with Unit 1, where we will be doing some key aspects related to poetry, prosody, the different types of poetry, and the ways in which a poets write poems, which means a technique used by poets to write poems. That's all for today. Bye. Well, we've come to the end of the sec of all the poems in this section. And as a concluding statement, I would like to say that all the poems in this section deal with one issue or concern that is close to us. It could be a personal loss, it could be memory, it could be culture, it could be marginalization. It could also be a response to life. However one may take it, this whole section is a comprehensive view of the different facets of human life. From personal loss to suffering, to discrimination, to loss of identity. These poems weave a host of issues. But the most important part of the segment is that none of the poems are negative in the sense that they are not nihilistic. They are not pessimistic. They ask man to surge ahead, to forge ahead, despite all oddities or difficulties in life. I hope these sessions were useful. Until we meet next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you.